Thank you. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, please. And that is the right chapter. Genesis chapter 12. You've been uh, following us on the live stream, or you've uh, moseyed on in here other uh, Sunday mornings, you know that we're going through the book of Genesis. Hey, we finished Revelation, the last book of the Bible, why not do the first book, right? It's amazing how the Bible ties together, is it not? And here it is, here's uh, the beginning of everything in this book of Genesis. You know what I've found, and perhaps you've come to the same conclusion, the Christian life is a life of faith. You can't live it without trust. Trust in the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, the just, that is, people that are saved, shall live by faith. And a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And so God permits difficulties in our lives not only to verify our faith, but to purify our faith, and ultimately to fortify our faith. Now, God knows the quality of your faith, but you don't. And so he allows situations to arise to clue you in on the real condition of your faith. Abraham is called a man of faith. And uh, he sometimes is actually referred to as the father of faith. He was a man whose faith was tested. And at times, his faith failed. But the result was, he grew into a very deep, strong man of faith by these experiences. I would say that if I'd sum up Abraham's faith, one word would sum it up, and that is authentic. Abraham's faith was authentic faith. It was real. That's the kind of faith that every believer in Jesus wants, is real, authentic faith. And I want to look at uh, Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, and I want us to see what authentic faith looks like. And so, before we do so, let's pause just one more time and pray. Lord, you said that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Well, that's what we're hearing now. And so, I pray that you would really deepen, strengthen, and give faith. Lord, I pray that the faith that uh, we profess is genuine. It's real. It's authentic faith, like Abraham's. Use this time today to do whatever you want to do in our lives. You want to make spiritual improvements and adjustments and absolute changes and transformations, and that's what we want. Lord, do it. Oh, Spirit of God, send, send the Spirit of Jesus upon us today. We ask it in His name. Amen. One of the first, I think, characteristics of authentic faith, do you have it? The first characteristic of authentic faith is that you believe God's promises. Here's a man that believed God's promises. And there is, there is I guess, an inexplicable link between God reaching out to all humanity and at the same time speaking to individuals. God reaches out to all people, but he speaks to individuals, and that's what we see happening in this instance in this man's life. And he speaks to individuals, and it seems like the individuals that God speaks to are receptive. They're responsive. And I can't understand precisely how that works. Because I know that God is sovereign, but I also know that God sovereignly will never violate one human will. So I don't understand how it works, but it works. And God is touching this man, whose name at that time is Abram, exalted father. And he's calling him. Look at chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. In fact, if you have it memorized, now would be a good time to practice it with me. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, 
Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Great verses. That's the call of this man, Abram. You know, when God, when, when God calls a man, he takes doesn't matter who the person is, he takes defective raw material and he shapes it into a useful life that will count forever because it's going to impact people for all eternity. There's no greater example of that than this man Abram. I came across a poem recently, or I was reminded of a poem that I I, uh, came across years ago, reminded recently of it, and listen to it, because it, uh, it really pegs, it really is spot on as far as how God deals with a man. When God wants to drill a man, and thrill a man, and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, Watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses, and which every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out, God knows what he's about. Wonderful way that God has with human beings. God calls people. God has a specific call on your life. It's different from the call on my life. But God has a call, a special purpose for your life. And when God deals with this man, Abram, and calls him, he makes a covenant with him. And a covenant in ancient Near Eastern life was a very common legal contract, I guess you would call it. But it was so significant uh, that everyone recognized that to enter into a covenant was a very serious responsibility, never to be entered into lightly. In fact, in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18, when God makes a covenant with Abram, he actually says, I will cut a covenant with Abram. Because a covenant actually required sacrificial death. It required bloodshed. Innocent animals were sacrificed and, and their blood was shed in the making of a covenant. And so God has called Abraham and what he is doing in these first three verses is he's making a covenant with Abraham. The origin of this covenant, it's called the Abrahamic covenant. That makes sense, right? A covenant that God made with Abram. The Abrahamic This covenant Of course, God is the prime mover. It's God that speaks to Abram. uh, Abram doesn't speak to God first. God speaks to Abram, calls him. Now the Lord said unto Abram, the Bible tells us in that very first verse, he's the prime mover. He's the one that speaks first. And the promise that he makes, the covenant that he cuts with Abram, is an unconditional one. Because the prime mover himself, if you study it out in chapter 15, the prime mover becomes the sole fulfiller. He becomes the single fulfiller. He's the only one that uh, becomes responsible. Usually in a contract, you have two parties in agreement. God says, you know what, Abram? I'm going to keep my part and your part. That's how 
important. That's how significant this covenant is. And so authentic faith begins with believing God's promise. And a covenant really is a promise. So he believes God's promise here. And God begins to work in this, in this man's life. You know why he believes God's promise? And you know why you and I can believe God's promise? Simple. Because of who he is. Because of who he is. In Hebrews chapter 6, and I think it's uh, uh, perhaps the, the 13th verse, God says, when I swore that covenant with Abraham, I swore by my own name because there was no one greater that I could swear by. So help me God. Isn't that an oath that is taken in a court of law? There is no one greater than you can swear by than God himself. And God said, when I made that covenant with you, I swore I made oath by my own name. That's why you can believe God's promise, because it's got him, his person behind it. And I think it's in verse 19 of that same sixth chapter of Hebrews. It says that this God who swears by his own name cannot lie. He cannot lie. So you can believe God's promise, folks, and you will have authentic faith only if you believe God's promise, but you can believe them, God's promises, because of who he is. He is a God that there is none other, and he cannot lie. He keeps his promises always. Here's the second thing I want you to see in verses 4 to 6. Let's read on. So God tells them, get out of your country. Leave your family. Follow me. Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. Now, Lot was his nephew. Lot's father, Abram's brother, died. His name was Haran. He died. And so Abram took responsibility for his brother's son, for his nephew, Lot. So Lot went with him, verse 4 says, and Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, or Canaan as we call it, into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Here's the second thing that is a major part of authentic faith. Not only must you believe the promises of God, but you must follow God's plan. You must follow God. If you believe the promises of God, it's not a big deal. It's not a great leap to then follow God's plan. You believe the promises? Okay, then I can follow the plan. Follow God's plan. That's what we see here. But every every demand of following God's plan is going to be it's going to be tested. Your faith is going to be exercised. You're going to meet challenges, obstacles in the way, which is going to really require unswerving obedience in following God's plan. And that's what we see in verse 4. You know, obedience is so important in the Christian life. It's the gold thread that uh, runs through the entire Bible. It's the heart of Christianity, is obedience to God. It's not about how much you know of the Bible. It's how much you live the Bible. It's how much you obey. When we make disciples... We're not just wanting them to know a whole bunch of things. Basically, we want disciples to be followers of God, to follow God's plan, to obey Him. We want them to submit to obedience. And faith, authentic faith, steps steps out despite the hindrances, whatever they might be. We learned in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, when we read it this morning, we finally got there, is that when Abram left his, when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he made a stopover for a period of time in Haran, and then went to 
to Canaan, when he was originally spoken to by God, he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know where God was leading him. And uh, he didn't know how this was going to happen. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew who he was to obey. And so he obeyed. Not no, By faith, the Bible says. By faith in what? By faith in his, uh, in, in his own ability to navigate? No. How would he navigate to a place that he had no idea where it was or what it was? By faith in God. Remember? The God whose promises you can believe. By faith. He went out not knowing where he was going, the Bible says. And without faith obedience steps, I don't care what you call it, it's not authentic faith. If you say you're a believer and you don't pay attention to the Word of God and obedience to the Word of God, <laughs> call it faith, but authentic faith takes steps of obedience. You know, one of the things that was amazing to me this last time that I was in Israel was I don't believe that in all of my visits there I ever saw the desert as green as it was. There had been so much rainfall over the year 2019 that way down, even in the Negev, uh, things were naturally green. It's amazing how a little moisture can make a desert begin to come alive. You know what authentic faith is? It is it, it's believing God's promises, and that's the moisture that brings about obedience, that brings about green obedience in your life. It springs up in your life, and it brings the evidence of life. Obedience is the greenness in the desert life that we're existing in. And I want you to see also in these verses, especially 5 and 6, his obedience, it was real commitment. It wasn't just partial, but it was real commitment. Let me, let me challenge you. Be sure that your commitment to God is total, not partial. Be sure that you fulfill all the will of God that you know about. Perhaps God has challenged you about something that you need to obey. Perhaps you have said, I surrender to you, Lord. Make sure that that surrender is complete. Make sure that that commitment is full commitment, total commitment. Don't stop short. Don't stop short of it. Interesting to me that on his way to Canaan, he stopped at Haran. You know what the word Haran means? Parched. Dry place. And it was. That's where his father died. By the way, he wasn't supposed to take his father with him, nor Lot either. He was not to, to, uh, to do that at all. He was to just leave his kindred. That's what the Bible said. Here's a third thing that I want you to take with you this morning. If you want to examine and make sure that faith is authentic, not only must you believe God's promise and follow God's plan, but look at verses 7 to 9. I call this, enjoy God's presence. Verses 7 to 9, Genesis 12. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. I call that enjoying God's presence, those, those verses. That's a vital part of authentic faith. Moving forward in faith. God keeps believers moving forward to face new challenges. But how does he do that? 
Well, you can't do that without a dependence upon God. And it, you can't depend upon a God until you know Him and until you experience His, His spiritual manifest presence in your life. When God reveals Himself to Abram, He speaks to Abram uh, here the second time, first time in verse 1. Here He speaks to him again in the land of Canaan. And I hope that you recognize God speaking to you. Does God speak to you? I'm not talking about an audible voice, but does God speak to your heart? Is your heart humble enough? Is it sensitive enough to hear God? To, is it open? Is your heart open to God, to whatever he has to say to you? Do you enjoy God's presence? Really, what's happening here in the building of the altar, two different places, is worship. That, to me, speaks of, he's an altar builder. Why is he an altar builder? Because people worship what they love. And it's very obvious to me that here's a man who has an overflowing heart of love for the Lord, for the things of God, the true and living God. And so he builds an altar, a place of worship, a place in which he pours out his heart to God, and God reveals himself to Abram. It's a two-way street communication, fellowship. But also, in that eighth verse, I see you enjoy God's presence not only through worship, but your focus. See what this guy is doing? He's building altars, but he's also dwelling in a tent. So he's an altar builder. He's a tent dweller. Why is he a tent dweller? Because as we already read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 8 through 16, he was not as focused on the land of Canaan that God promised to his descendants as he was on an eternal country and an eternal city that the writer of Hebrews says is heavenly. He dwelt in a tent because he realized this is only a temporary residence here on this earth. This is not where I am going to put all my aspirations. This is not where I'm going to, to build permanently. A tent is something that has stakes in the ground that can be easily pulled up. The tent can be folded and you can move on. And by the way, as much emphasis as Americans put on the human body, we ought to be reminded that the Bible calls the body a tent. It's not a permanent dwelling. It's something that we're here for a short time. It folds and we're on to our eternal home, an eternal body. So he's a tent dweller. Here's a guy whose emphasis is on heavenly things, not on earthly things. How about yours? Authentic faith is not all caught up in the things of this life. Authentic faith is not focused on earthly things mainly, but heavenly things mainly, and earthly things as necessary. Spiritual mindedness versus carnal mindedness. The carnal mind is focused on earthly things. How many times does the scripture warn us that we're just, we're just foreigners and we're pilgrims on this earth? This is not a permanent dwelling. Don't get uh, too involved here. Don't get too entangled with earthly things. Set your mind, your thinking, and your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. He's a tent dweller. Focus. Authentic faith has the right focus. And it's not on earthly things. If you're tied to earthly things, if your biggest uh, 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 tie in life is your job, is your, is your house, is uh, uh, anything, even your family. You are not heavenly minded. You're earthly minded. There's something much bigger than all of that. And that's what this man was focused upon. And that's what authentic faith focuses upon. So don't fool yourself. Worship and the right focus. And then one final thing and we're done. Here I see a man who exercises authentic faith because he has an opportunity to see God's power. In the 10th through the 20th verse, which I'm not going to take the time to read, here is what happens. 
He's in the land of Canaan that God led him to, and he, it's like he no sooner gets there and a great famine comes. And so instead of staying put where God led him, he takes matters, I feel, into his own hands, and he migrates south to Egypt. And in that Nile Delta, uh, uh, Nile River Delta region, there's food to be had. And so he does what seems to be, humanly, the prudent thing. He takes his, his clan and he goes down to Egypt because of the famine. But on the way, he already had this, uh, he already had this worked out with his wife that when we get to Egypt, you tell them that you're my sister, so when they see your beauty and they want you the, in their harem or they want you to be their wife, they won't kill me in order to get you because uh, I'll just be your brother. And that was a half-truth because uh, both Sarah and uh, Abram had uh, the same father, but not the same mother. So it was a half-truth, but it was a lie, because he was married, and uh, that was his wife. They get down there, and sure enough, this uh, city king in Egypt, he sees the beauty of Sarai, and he wants her in his harem. And so he takes her, and when he does that, everything goes south for that man, Though everything starts to, to go wrong. And uh, he then is told that this woman is Abram's wife. And he gets livid with Abram. Why have you done this? You've, brought to, you, you've almost brought destruction upon me and my people by lying to us. Here, take your stuff and here's some other stuff of ours. Take it and go. We don't want to die. You know, listen to me very carefully. I think we get the wrong idea. We think that uh, people that have faith never fail. They never have lapses of faith. And that's not fair and that's not true. I think it's because we only hear about the victories of, say, a George Mueller, which is a, a great example of, of a man of faith. We only hear about the victories and we never hear about their, their defeats. We never hear about their lack of faith. But uh, trust me, every human being has moments where their faith wavers, where they lapse, where they lack faith, regardless how strong a person of faith they are. At some time or another, everyone stumbles. But I think what we have here is a very teachable moment in a display of God's power how God overrules this man's folly, this man's foolishness, this man's lie. God's hand is on this man. And God is going to work. And God's going to display his power. In verse 10, and I'll just read that, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. That's all, that famine, that's all about circumstances. Let me tell you something. God allows difficulties. God allows difficulties in your situation to, uh, to develop you, to, to develop your faith, to sanctify you. And it's a big mistake to run from your problems. Let me warn you, never let your circumstances dictate your obedience. Repeat that. Never let your circumstances dictate your obedience. Don't let your circumstances determine whether or not you're going to obey God at that particular point. He should have stayed. Stay put unless God moves you. Because whether you realize it or feel it or not, God is at work and the safest place for you is in smack dab in the middle of God's will. Because God's grace that leads you can also keep you where he leads you. And then in the remainder of this chapter, verses 11 to 20, here's another thing. It's not circumstances, but it's people. He's, he runs from his difficult circumstances 
only to end up facing dangerous people. Refuse, folks. Refuse to let the fear of man, or anything for that matter, control you. Refuse to let the fear of people control you. Instead, trust God. Abraham schemed. He used human wisdom and half-truths. And uh, he was trying to escape the, the people, problems that he had, because he was concerned about himself. He was con concerned that he'd be killed for his wife. He was concerned about Abram. And here is a man that God said, you know what, Abram, I'm going to take you and I am going to bless all the families of this earth through you. And instead of being a blessing to that, uh, those people in Egypt, he became a curse to them because he took matters into his own hand. My wife and I, on our way to church, would often listen to Ravi Zacharias of course, he went to be with the Lord a few weeks ago. I always enjoyed his, uh, his messages and his talks. And I heard him say that when he was in his 20s and a student in Toronto, Canada, that uh, he wanted to work as a military chaplain over in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And he applied, and they, they allowed him in his 20s, early 20s, to speak to mainly, he said, young people, some military, but mainly young people there in Vietnam. And he said when he got over there, he got connected with a young, devout Vietnamese Christian man who was 17. Robbie said, I was 25, he was 17 total. We had 42 years under our belt. And he said, he was my translator, and we went all over, we went all over Vietnam, all over South Vietnam. He said, we preached to thousands, and literally we saw thousands of young people get saved. Thousands of young people came to Christ during those, those days. He said, God did some amazing things. He said, uh, after about four years, we said our goodbyes, and uh, I came back to the States, and I never thought that my translator and I would ever cross paths again. But he said, one evening at 11 o'clock, I was in my hotel room, in British, uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, Vancouver, British Columbia, and he said, my phone rang, and I answered the phone, and he said on the other end, I heard a man say, Brother Rafi, and he said, Hin? Hin Fom? It had been 17 years. He said, Brother Rafi, you recognize my voice. He said, well, you're the only one that ever called me Brother Rafi. He said, where are you? Hen said, I'm in California. I'm working on an MBA. Do you have a few minutes? He said, I have a lot of minutes. So he told him the story. He said, after you left, Vietnam fell to the communists. And he said, not long after that, I was arrested and they accused me of being a spy for the CIA because I was so fluent in English. And I explained to them, I had no contact with the CIA. I just translated for uh, some American speakers and some military. But I, I, they said, yeah, no one admits to working for the CIA. And they threw me in, in prison. And he said, I was in prison and they would not let me read anything in English. All they ever gave to me was, uh, was communist works of Marx and Engel in either French or Vietnamese. He said it was Marx and Engel, French and Vietnamese. 
day in and day out. That's all, and they forced me to read it. And he said, I got to a point in my life that uh, they pounded my head so hard that I got to the place where I was doubting, maybe I believed a lie. Maybe there isn't a God, just like they say. And he said, I went to, to bed that one night, and I said, all right, that's it. In the morning, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to talk to God anymore. I'm not going to believe in God anymore. And he said, in the morning, I was called into the office of the commander, and he said, your job today is to clean the, the latrine. And he said, uh, Ravi, you may have seen latrines that are horrible all over Vietnam with me, but you've never seen one like the prison camp latrine. He said, we had to put a mask over our mouth and nose, like some of you. We had to put a mask over our mouth and nose so that we could breathe. And he said, I was in that latrine with a mop and a bucket, and I was cleaning up that slop. And he said, I got into, uh, there was a toilet, and by the toilet there was a bucket with paper in it. And he said, I was about to empty the paper out of that bucket, and I happened to look in that bucket, and I thought I saw a piece of paper with English writing on it. So he said, I looked, I pulled out that piece, I washed it off, and I put it in my pocket. And later on that night, when everyone in the camp was asleep, I had a little mini flashlight, and I took my flashlight out very carefully, and I, oh, and I shined it on that piece of wet paper. And he said, at the top of that page, it said, Romans chapter 8. And I began to read, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither death, nor life, nor tribulation, nor principality. He said, Brother Ravi, when I was done reading that page, I just fell on my knees and I wept. And I said, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. You've, you've met me and you've given me the, the best verse that I could have asked for. He said, the next morning I got up and I went right to the commandant and I said, can I clean the latrine again today? And that became my job. And he said, every day I would look in that trash can and I would find a piece of paper and I would wash it off and stick it in my pocket. And I found out later that the commandant was given a Bible and he was tearing out a piece at a time and using it as toilet paper. He said, I would take that every night, and I would have my devotions. And he said, after a few years, they came to me and they said, uh, you can go free. He said, I quickly got a group of 53 people together. One was, I think, the vice president's son or daughter, and we decided that we were going to escape from Vietnam said, we built a, a boat to take us across the sea to Thailand. And he said, during that time, one day there was a knock at the door. I opened the door and it was four Viet Cong soldiers. And they said, we heard that you're trying to escape. Are you trying to escape? Is that true? And he said, with a perfect uh, expression, I said, no. No, I'm not trying to escape. They questioned him some more, and finally he convinced them that he wasn't trying to escape, and they left. And after they left, he said, oh, God, what have I done? I've done it again. I've denied you again. Lord, if you, if you want me to tell the truth, then have them come sometime before I escape again. And he said, I never thought that would happen, but he said hours before our escape was planned, same four Viet Cong knocked at the door 
And they were armed to the teeth, and they grabbed him, and they threw him up against the wall and said, you are trying to escape. We know you are. Tell us the truth. He said, all right, I'm going to escape. And I have 53 others that are going with me, and we're going on a boat. What are you going to do? Imprison me? Kill me? No, we want to go with you. 58 of them got on that boat. Four of those Viet Cong in previously were skilled fishermen. And he said, we were engulfed in such a storm that we would have surely capsized had it not been for the skill of those four Viet Cong uh, fishermen that were great sailors, and we got to Thailand, and then here I am, I got to America, and I'm working on my MBA. He said shortly after that, he flew, his name is Hian Pham, he flew him down to his house because Hian wanted uh, Ravi to perform a wedding ceremony for him. He found a beautiful Vietnamese girl that he was going to marry. He wanted Ravi to perform the, the wedding. And uh, he said, we were sitting at our kitchen table. My children were young then. They were sitting around the table. And he said, he and said to them, he looked across the table and he said to them, you know, you think you can manage your life on your own, but it never works. It never works. The thing that you must do is you must, you must develop an intimacy with God and put your hand in His, and He'll guide you safely through your journey. The bottom line is, if I could put it in the context of our message, be an altar builder. Be a worshiper. Stay in fellowship with God regardless of circumstances, regardless of people. Get back to the altar. The Christian life is authentic. It's an authentic life of faith. And, and it's, it's Jesus in you. It's Jesus living His life through you as you depend upon Him to do so. It's Christ in you. And you by faith depending upon Him. Let's pray. As we do so, if you don't know the Lord is your personal Savior, you can settle that right now. Maybe you haven't believed upon Him. Maybe you've never received Him. I hope that you will do so. You can just trust Him as your Savior now. You can say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve your judgment in hell, but I believe that Jesus already took my punishment on that cross. That's why He died and shed His blood. And I believe that He rose again. And I want to receive Him and trust Him as my personal Savior right now. If you are a believer already, but maybe you've sold out, and maybe your faith has wavered, maybe you have, your faith isn't all that authentic at this point, you can rededicate and recommit yourself to the Lord this morning. And I hope that you'll do so even as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, we thank you, we praise you, we ask, O oh God, that you would uh, teach us, as you did Abram, teach us to just follow you, to believe your promises, to follow your plan. Lord, that, uh, that we would uh, enjoy your presence, and that in the end, we would just see your power as you displayed it in Abraham's life. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.